we all have a great love for Mary. It's wonderful that today's day with Mary is here in this church dedicated to her under the title of Our Lady Help of Christians. We have a banner towards the back of the church and also a wonderful uh, stained glass window up in the choir loft of Our Lady Help of Christians. The original is in Turin and uh, uh, under that title the famous St. John Don Bosco had a great devotion. And that devotion has spread throughout the whole world so that Our Lady of Christian, Help of Christians is one of the titles under which we refer to Mary as our patroness. <coughs> if you examine that uh, statue and uh, stained glass image, as with many other statues of Mary, you will see underneath the feet crushing the head of the serpent. That is very biblical. I mentioned that the, Euc the Eucharist is biblical. So is Mary crushing the head of the serpent. Very biblical. <coughs> Symbolic of her role in Jesus' salvation. Our Lady of Fatima is the image we have before us here today. Sister Lucia said that we should pray to her often and one of the titles that she loved was Our Lady of the Rosary. It's another reason why we love the Rosary. Mary herself, herself and Fatima uh, communicated to Lucia that we should pray to her under that title and often said to pray the Rosary. Crushing the head of the serpent is symbolic not just of Mary's role, but of Jesus' role. And everything we know of Mary is because of Jesus. If we didn't know Jesus, we wouldn't know Mary. History would never have recorded anything about her. She was a humble girl of Nazareth, and also in Jerusalem, served at the temple there, but we wouldn't know, have known of her, except for Jesus. And because of Jesus, she is not only known throughout the world and loved, the special titles under which she is known and the special gifts that she was given by God are because of Jesus. So the two go together, Mary and Jesus. Perhaps the central message of Our Lady of Fatima was amend your lives. Turn your lives around. <clears throat> that too is biblical. If we go to the Gospel of St. Mark, the first, and that was probably the first Gospel written, the first words of Jesus, public words of Jesus, were, the time has come, The time is now fulfilled for the good news. Believe the good news and change your lives. Believe the good news and change your lives. Mary, in asking us at Fatima to amend our lives, was echoing what Jesus said in the Gospel of St. Mark. Change your lives. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand amend your lives and believe the good news. So we're repeating the same message that Jesus preached 2,000 years later through Our Lady of Fatima. I've already said this morning that, or <coughs> earlier on this afternoon that the Eucharist calls us 
to change our lives. And again, if we look at the world, we have to say that is continuously the same message that God wants us to hear, the message of Jesus, the message of Mary, change your lives. So it is good that there are so many people here today praying, not praying just for themselves, but praying for the world with sin is unfortunately widespread and corrupting the young and doing enormous damage. We want those people to change their lives as we are trying to change ours. I said that Mary's praises, Mary's gifts, the glories of Mary, they all have a connection with Jesus. Let's look at that. In a very real sense, Mary was predestined. We go right back to the account in Genesis of the creation of the world and of the first two human beings, Adam and then Eve. We will find that after their fall, there was the promise of a Messiah. There was a promise that the head of the serpent that represented the devil, that corrupted those two people, and they fell into terrible evil, committed the original sin. But there would be someone who would crush that head. So Mary's part of that plan of salvation, right from the very beginning, it was Jesus who crushed the head, of course. But Mary had a role in salvation, as we will hear. So she is picked, uh, depicted with her foot on the head of Satan. Jesus is often called the new Adam. And St. Paul says that. As in Adam, if you, the world fell, humanity fell into sin. As with Jesus, they rose again. As with Adam, all sin. In Jesus, all saved. He's the new Adam. But many spiritual writers say that Mary is the new Eve. In uh, uh, Ita uh, Latin and Italian, Eve and Ave uh, yeah. have the same three letters. A-V-E or E-V-A. So you can turn the word around. And Ave, which means hail, turned around is Eva, which means Eve. So that's often been written about by, by sacred writers. That Mary is the new Eve. How is that? Eve, by her disobedience, and Adam's disobedience, but Eve, by her disobedience, brought about the fall of the human race in their rebellion against God. And we inherit that. Mary is the new Eve. By her obedience, she gave the world its saviour. By her obedience, she said, Be it done unto me according to your will. She could have said no, she said yes, when the angel said that she was to be the mother of the Saviour. She said, be it done unto me according to your will. Whereas Eve disobeyed God, Mary was completely obedient to all the handmaid of the Lord. So we can see how salvation came into the world in this process, that Mary was part of that, part of the history of salvation, and she stands as the one who said yes, and Eve as the one who said no. Among her great glories is the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception means that she was conceived without sin. 
all of us except for Jesus himself, came into this world as it were with that guilt upon us in the form of original sin, part of a race that through Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And we need the saving grace of Jesus which comes to us through baptism. It is said that today with the fall off in faith with many people who call themselves Catholics, who call themselves Christians, who once would have baptised their children, for some reason or other, don't bother. There are many children growing up today without baptism. I notice when I go around to parishes and see the number of baptisms in the book, in some parishes the number has gone down. And I ask why, and they say, well, we don't know, but we think that many families are out there who haven't bothered to baptise their children. We must make sure that the children are baptised because that is the inflow of grace which gets rid of original sin and starts that child off on the path, on the journey of grace with God. The Immaculate Conception, we think of that for a moment and we think of uh, uh, the the words of the angel that called Mary full of grace. Right from the very beginning she was full of grace. Why was she preserved free from original sin? <coughs> she was preserved free. As the Catechism of the no, as Lumen Gentium in the Second Vatican Council said that it was appropriate for her role that she would be free from sin. Otherwise she could not have given full consent. And that's true. We say we can give full consent uh, to what God wants. But we're often held back by our own imperfections, by our own sins, from that carrying out that full consent. Mary's consent was full because there was no sin. Nothing that was holding back her consent at all. She was, gave full consent uh, when she said, to be it done unto me according to your word. So uh, she was preserved free from original sin in order to give her free consent to, to the angel of God that came to see her. And it was appropriate for such a role. So I have the, the words of Lumen Gentium here. Mary was enriched by God with gifts appropriate to such a role. And one of the gifts was to be untainted by any sin, especially original sin. Mary's seemed to be the All-Holy One. In fact, in the long Eastern tradition, uh, in the Church, they, they coined a name for Mary, Panagia, the Panagia, and that means the All-Holy. So they would speak of Mary, but they'd also speak of the Panagia, the one who is All-Holy. And we need to see, Mary was All-Holy because she was chosen. Mary was all holy because from the very beginning with the promise of the Redeemer, Mary was chosen by God so that she would be all holy and that the son born of her would be the Messiah. She has the title a virgin mother, a virgin and a mother. Why the virginity? It was to make it clear to us that the child born of her did not have a human father. That, as uh, the Gospels say, she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and conceived by that action of the Holy Spirit a child. So Mary is a virgin and a mother. And the real Father is, the, is God the Father through the action of the Holy Spirit. 
and Joseph, the wonderful Joseph, who looked after Mary as the foster father. So Mary is a virgin in order that we can understand and more readily accept that the child is a divine child. Mary is a human mother, but her child is divine through the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. She is virgin and mother. She is a real mother. She is the mother of Jesus, the mother of the Lord, the mother of God. Because Jesus, her son, was truly human and truly divine. So we find those phrases in the Gospel. The mother of Jesus is here. The mother of the Lord is here. And we know the mother of God is the title of the early church, the all-holy mother of God. I said she had a plan in our salvation. And that plan began to our knowledge in the first pages of Genesis when the child of the sea would be would crush the serpent's head. So she has a role in the crushing of evil and of the evil one. She doesn't have that in isolation and she would not have that were it not for Jesus. So again we see every title that she has is because of her relationship with Jesus. She gave her cooperation to the work of Jesus. She gave her sufferings to the work of Jesus. We hear again in, the, in St. Paul's letters how he's trying to make up for the sufferings of Jesus. What is um, absent from the sufferings of Jesus. In other words, Jesus accepts as part of his, this is a mystery, as part of his self-sacrifice for the whole world, the sufferings of others, so that they can unite their sufferings with his, and he makes them holy, and makes them part of his work of salvation. They can never substitute for that. He is the Saviour, no other. But he accepts our sufferings and unites them with his. Mary's sufferings were intense, especially when she saw her son taken prisoner, then tortured, and then crucified, and she was there. Great courage, most of the disciples had run away, she stayed, and her deep sufferings were united with those of Jesus. Just a, a little meditation about Jesus on the cross. We know that physically he suffered enormously. He suffered uh, from scourging, from the crown of thorns, from the spear in his side, sat from the nails in his hands and feet, suffered um, insults and uh, terrible things were said about him, and he died on the cross. His physical sufferings were intense. But what about the mental suffering? Yes, he suffered mentally too, because what was happening to him was he was accepting on, on his own shoulders the sins of the world. All the sins of the world before, present, to come. And he was accepting all those and felt the burden of sin. What is the ultimate burden of sin? To feel absolutely abandoned by God. What did Jesus say on the cross? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He was allowed to feel that sense of the absence of his Father because it was precisely that absence of God, which is the end of a life given to sin. And yet he was sinless, but he was taking on himself 
both the physical sufferings but the mental anguish too of the sinner so that the sinner could be redeemed by his death and his resurrection. This is all in his humanity. As, as the Son of God, of course, he was aware. But in his humanity, because we are human, he took on himself physically and mentally all those sufferings and was able to cry out the words of the psalm, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The natural end of a life given to sin is that, that the sinner will feel there is nothing left. No love, no friendship, no goodness, just this sense of abandonment. Jesus purified that too by his suffering and his death. So in taking on the sins of the world, he also took on the sufferings of the world. And we can unite our sufferings with his. We look at Mary, a lady of sorrows, and we remember what she suffered. You and I also suffer. And some suffer more than others. And that's a mystery too, I don't know why. But when they speak to me, I encourage them to, to put their sufferings in the hands of Mary because she's with her son at the foot of the cross and he took her sufferings with his. To place their sufferings in the hands of Mary who knew suffering and they find it easier then to bear because they know that Mary herself understands and Mary knows that her husband, her sorry, her, her um, uh, son, the divine saviour, would understand the sufferings of the world because he too suffered. We shouldn't be fearful of suffering, it is part of sinful humanity. But we know that suffering in the case of Jesus was redemptive and therefore we have the possibility of offering our sufferings through Mary to Jesus. Mary also is part of our salvation by her prayers, her intercessory prayers for us. She's called Mother of the Church because she was there at the beginning of the Church. She was there at Pentecost. She felt the Holy Spirit come down as all the others did. She had already been conceived of the Holy Spirit, filled with graces, and the Holy Spirit came. She was there with all the others when the church was formed and moved out to give good news to the world. She was there. So we call her mother of the church. Not only because of Pentecost, we call her mother of the church because the church is the body of Christ. There are two senses in which we talk of the body of Christ. One is Jesus in the Blessed Eucharist. And the other, connected with us, is the body of Christ, the Church. Because we are all members, we are all, um, we are all branches of the vine. We are one body, the body of Christ. So Mary was the mother of the physical body of Jesus. She is also the mother of the mystical body of Jesus, the Church. Under all these titles we can turn to Mary. Our Lady of Fatima is calling us to change, to do repentance, to change. And we should never forget that because that was the word of Jesus, his first words of the Gospel. The kingdom has come, the time has come. Change your lives and listen to the good news. We can turn to Mary under the title of Our Lady of the Rosary as Lucia heard from Mary herself. We turn to Mary under the title of Our Lady Help of Christians, because her foot is on the head of Satan. Her prayers can help crush evil. We turn to Mary under the title of the Virgin Mother, for we know that her virginity was to instruct us that her son, his father, is God the Father. And she's a mother 
so that all motherhood is sacred. And she's mother of the church because the church is the body of Christ. By her prayers, she can help us grow closer to her son Jesus. So today, in our prayers this day of Mary, let us remember Mary under all these titles, and there are many other besides, because she is the handmaid of the Lord, she was the one predestined to be the mother of the Saviour. She was one with him in her sufferings and in her prayers, and she has uh, said yes, a complete yes to the will of God. And we could follow her and say yes to the will of God in our own lives.